Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of October 18th, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. Also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we take a look at what's happening or not in the special session. Second, we explain why we think the fall revenue forecast due in December is going to surprise many and have a big impact both on next year's regular session and potentially the entirety of the 2022 election cycle. And third, we discuss the Alaska Municipal League's strong pushback on a state sales tax. And now, let's join Michael. We're continuing now. Uh, our weekly discussions, the weekly top three with Brad Keithley from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. He joins us this morning. We're going to dive into it, the weekly top three, and start off with some things. Um, we've got, uh, we're going to talk about the session and the uh, DOR forecasts and AML. Although I wanted Brad to comment real quickly on the fact that he just saw our favorite guy that is no longer in the legislature. That was uh, legislative, former finance director, le- legislative finance director, uh, uh, Teal, uh, David Teal, who was always a fan of more government money than uh, than private citizen money, he is now signed on as a brand new, newly minted co chair of the Walker campaign. Uh, surprise, surprise, surprise! Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's just a. We talked last week about uh, about some indications of of what Walker's fiscal plan was looking like. Uh, his lieutenant governor candidate, Heidi Dragas, had uh, made a post uh, that was talking about Governor Dunleavy's PFD as being a big PFD. And of course, Governor Dunleavy is, is Governor Dunleavy's proposed PFD is a cut, a 40 percent cut from the statutory PFD down to POMV 5050. And she was calling that still big. Um, so I think David Teal uh, joining the team is yet another indication that uh, that the Walker fiscal plan is not going to be that different from the Walker fiscal plan when he was governor before, which is to rely on PFD cuts to uh, help uh, continue to fund government. Right, pushing, exactly. Pushing the burden off on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families. Yeah, it is the, it is the basically facepalm moment for the Walker campaign. Uh, this like the you know, second verse, same as the first kind of thing. Um, all right. Well, let's uh, let's dive into this thing and start off with the weekly top three, the the legit weekly top three. Uh, first and foremost, the session is anything going to actually come out of this? I mean, I, I pretty much already had my say on this, but what do you think? What is it going to produce, if anything? Well, I, I think the second week uh, uh, was sort of the same as the first. Uh, not any indication of uh, of any movement toward. A resolution by the end of the session. Uh, there were a couple of things that that are interesting. Uh, one, uh, particularly over in the Senate, uh, as reported uh, uh, last week by the Alaska Landmine, uh, Senate President uh, Machiki evidently set sent out a memo or an email to uh, to the Senate members, uh, suggesting that he was considering establishing a new committee. Uh, this uh, uh, a fully functional uh, Senate special committee focused on the uh, progressing the work of the bipartisan fiscal plan uh, working group, and I think many view that as a, as as an effort by Macheki to end run 
the, uh, the Senate Finance Committee form another committee that could be uh, could be uh, 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 delegated uh, legislation related to the fiscal plan focused on the, the the fiscal plan that came out of the bipartisan group um, and find that and and get that as a way uh, to the Senate. Now that 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 was what he proposed last week. Uh, it hasn't made it to the uh, to the floor yet, um, and I and I, that's probably because it doesn't have. Uh, support uh, sufficient support on the floor yet to to make it to the to the floor. Uh, when you've got the votes, you vote. When you don't have the votes, you keep on talking. So, um, but it but it seems to be, you know, we, we've talked a lot about will the Senate reorganize? Will um, uh, conservative senators form with those on the left that support a full PFD uh, as a way of dealing with the bottleneck that is Senate finance? This appears to be a proposal by Machiki to, uh, uh, to to sort of deal with that issue without uh, without reorganizing, uh, but it's not uh, it's not taken off yet. So the Senate continues to be uh, stalled. Uh, no forward movement. No uh, substantive hearings in the Senate uh, on uh, on anything uh, related to uh, to the fiscal plan, um, and so it's just sort of sort of sitting there. This is the third week of a four week session. So if it doesn't move, uh, if, if things don't, oh, well, it's already too late. But if but if, but if if things were ever gonna move, uh, it should have been last week. If they're ever, ever gonna move, it should be this week. Um, and if we go through another week without any movement, then you can pretty well say, uh, uh, I told you so, uh, nothing's gonna happen. Over in the house, uh, <laughs> there is some activity. Uh, there have been a series of hearings in ways and means uh, and in a couple of other uh, committees, Judiciary and State Affairs. Judiciary and State Affairs have, have been hearing, uh, have heard uh, Senator Kaufman's uh, proposal on a, a spending cap, uh, which is interesting and, and, and a subject we'll discuss on a, on a sub subsequent show at some point. Um, the Ways and Means have largely been focused on uh, revenue bills. There have been various revenue bills submitted uh, uh, Senator or Representative Snyder, Liz Snyder submitted a 50-50 bill. Uh, Ways and Means Committee, under the leadership of Ivy Sponholtz, submitted a 25-75 uh, PFD, sort of back to the Jennifer Johnston approach. Ken McCarty, uh, uh, submit, Representative McCarty, submitted a, a bill uh, on, on the PFD. Representative Garr submitted one on a, on a sales tax, which we'll discuss uh, a little later uh, uh, in the program, I guess it was Representative Garr and Representative Drummond uh, jointly submitted that. So right. there have been, and there were, and there were, there was a committee hearing where all of the the revenue proposals, uh, uh, two two committee hearings before Ways and Means, where all of the revenue pro proposals were given uh, given the opportunity to be presented. None of them have moved forward. Not even the not even the Ways and Means proposal, uh, the committee proposal of twenty five seventy five. None of them have. Uh, have moved forward, so it's um, there, there's a lot of act, there's there's activity on the House side, but I wouldn't say there's a lot of progress uh, uh, toward reaching a final bill. Well, and and as you're watching these things, and of course all the other th the other thing that I heard about Senator Murchicki was that he had approached the the uh, and I have not confirmed this with him, but uh, apparently somebody had been he'd, he'd approached the. Um, the either the district or the Alaska Republican Party Central Committee and said he was looking for uh, a, a move from them that uh, if anybody tried to break the caucus that they would be censured from the uh, from from the state committee <laughs> trying to solidify something I guess trying you know he said last week he was he was trying to herd if it was like trying to herd cats and maybe he was looking for a little leverage to kind of keep everybody together so that he could get this committee moving. Um, I mean, I have no idea at this point whether or not that would even help anything at this point. I mean, as you said, we're kind of we're kind of down to the wire. I mean, there's really not a lot of time left to get much anything done. We're into week three. We've only got about another uh, 12 days or so, and then we're we're pretty much over 12, 14 days, and we're done. I will say, I will say uh, uh, that I'll give credit to Macheki in, in this regard. It, he was he was proposing to focus. Uh, at least the, the proposal I read proposed to focus 
uh, the the special committee's activity on the bipart on the outcome of the bipartisan working group, which as we discussed last week is something that House Finance just sort of threw out the window, or House uh, Ways and Means rather threw out the window on day one when they came up with their proposal. Their right, right. Proposal twenty five seventy five. So Machiki's focus, I think, on on uh, uh, articulated focus and focusing on the the outcome of the bipartisan working group. I think that that does deserve uh, credit. The, the fact it hasn't made it to the floor, the fact that it hasn't apparently garnered enough support yet to uh, to, to come into being uh, uh, probably isn't a good sign. But but he, the the direction of the special committee would seem to would seem to go in the right way. Right. No, I mean, I, I, we've talked about that, how we need to be looking at this, uh, you know, that they put so much work into it. And it was so amazing that such a separate group was able to come together and, uh, you know, and to agree on basic foundational principles uh, on this was pretty amazing. And then it was summarily just basically discarded by the leadership uh, in the House and the Senate up at that point. So, yeah, so it is definitely uh uh, it definitely would be a good move. I don't know why, if that's the case, why it hasn't gone to the, why he doesn't think he has the votes for it at this point. So maybe we can get a chance to talk to him about that uh, later this week, but we'll uh, we'll see. Any other thoughts on, I mean, so I guess final predictions, is anything going to come out of this or is this thing just going to die a slow death and then we're going to move over to election season 2022? Michael, I think uh, I, I don't think anything's going to come out of this session. There's no indication uh, after the second week that they're making any progress. <clears throat> I mean, the House is House is holding these hearings, but it doesn't it doesn't right now appear that it's headed toward a bill that will work its way up to the House or a bill that would have any chance uh, uh, once it crossed over to the Senate. So I think I think a lot of this activity is really just uh, just sort of going through the motions to say you did something during the special session, not to be accused of being, to avoid it being accused of being a do nothing uh, uh, legislature. Um, and some would say that it's all sort of laying the predicate for what goes on in the regular session. But as we'll discuss in the next segment, I think the regular session is gonna be blown up by the, uh, in part by the uh, 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 fall revenue forecast that will come out in December in advance of the budget or together with the budget. Uh, that the governor is going to propose, and so I'm not sure uh, what you, you can you can see logically. Some argue that oh, we're we're getting our act together. We're going through the motions of these bills. We're understanding the bills. We're trying to put together a package to go to uh, uh, to go to the regular session. But uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that's really you know going to progress to a bill in the regular session uh, uh, either. So it's a. Um, um, Interesting ideas, as I say, James Kaufman's idea on a spending cap is different uh, than what uh, others have proposed before, different than what you and I have talked about before. I'm not sure quite how I feel about it. I'm trying to crunch some numbers uh, right. on it. So you're, you're getting some new di new ideas out there, uh, but uh, but I'm not sure it's it's. I mean, any of that is 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 translating into progress. Well, and even if the Senate was able to pull off their end run around the Finance Committee in the Senate and create this committee, the problem is is that's just half the equation. The House is still gridlocked, and of course, they're only going to run things through Ways to Be Mean Committee and all that stuff. So it's uh, you know, I mean, it, it, and again, with two weeks left. I just don't see how it's going to happen. Um, I mean, my prediction at this point is that we're going to we'll, it, it's going to be a nothing burger when it's all said and done. Yeah, that that's my prediction also. I mean, we always always can be surprised. You know, the the way of legislative negotiations is no, 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 no until you get to yes, and then all of a sudden, once you have the votes, you vote and bang. You know, it it, it goes goes forward. Um, so there's always that potential, but it but there's nothing right now. Uh, in either body that would make you think that's uh, uh, that there's a yes at the end of all of uh, at the end of all of this effort. Unless the Senate is reorganizing this, exactly nothing is going to happen, says Harold. And as I pointed out, even if the Senate does get organized uh, or reorganized or figure something out or creates a new committee or does whatever it is, you still got to face up against the House, right, Brad? I mean, they have no interest in in, in in taking any of this up, they their their whole tactic again has been delay, delay, delay. It's time, you know, time dilation used as a weapon, and that's been working very well for them for the last six years. 
Yeah, and I think on on the substance, uh, the Ways and Means Committee uh, uh, bill, which is a 2575 uh, PFD, is reflective of where leadership's at. Uh, and, you know, that's 2575 statutory. Uh, and it's 25 uh, to the PFD may appropriate 25 to the PFD. So um, I, I think that's where leadership is. And, and, and you're right. Even if the Senate something, sent something over, uh, that's what the House would send back, and uh, and and you know we've we've made uh, we've made no progress. So um, it's a I, I I you know as we've as we've discussed before on uh, on the show, I think we're headed to the elections next year. I think the uh, the regular session next year is gonna, there's going to be some sound and some fury, but I don't think any progress. And I think you know we're this is all heading to the 2022 election and. Uh, and hopefully some clarification from the public about what they want. Yeah, no, absolutely. Walker Dragas and all their co-chairs, that's what they want. They want your PFD. They, the goal is to have no PFD is what some people are saying, and I, I feel is right. It's not just a, cool, a tool to get cash, says Sean. It's a push to disenfranchise Alaskans as shareholding citizens. They want uh, quiet compliance subjects groveling like the Dark Age serfs. I mean, that was really the whole point of Walker trying to push this into a sovereign wealth fund instead of being a dividend, um, is that it would then all become government money and government largesse, and it would truly become welfare instead of a dividend because it would fundamentally change the program, right? Yeah. yeah I mean, anytime, uh, once it became subject to appropriation, it became, it, in many people's minds, it became a government program. I mean, you hear about it now as, as being articulated as government spending. You hear about it as government revenues. You hear about it as, you know, as a, as, as, you know, a government, a government program, that the PFD is a government program. Once it became subject to appropriation, that's exactly what happened. And, and we're going to stick in that. I mean, <clears throat> People are going to are going to continue to go down that road uh, to avoid, uh, uh, you know, exposing the top 20 percent to part of the cost of government. They're going to continue to go down the road of, you know, the PFD is at our discretion is, is whatever we want to give it to. Right. To you. Well, and again, that goes back to time dilation and everything else. They want that. They want that fight because it <clears throat> it basically is a. You know, look over here, look over here, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Let's fight it out about the PFD, and we won't talk about the fundamental problems that the state has and that we're fiscally bankrupt at this point. Uh, well, not fiscally, we're not bankrupt, but we're fiscally broken at this point. Uh, and so let's fight about the PFD. We won't get into the deeper issues of all this other stuff. And I think I think that that's, that's planned. Part of that is it appears to be planned. Well, I, and and as long as as long as they can focus the revenue on the PFD PFD cuts again, as we've talked time and time again on the show, the top twenty percent aren't participating in in the cost of government, and so they're not pushing back uh, on spending levels. That's exactly what you know. Some of the Democrats, a lot of the Democrats have have wanted to push the burden to the PFD, push it to middle and lower income Alaska families, not engage the top twenty percent in the discussion because they're not paying for it. Uh, and, you know, and continue to, you know, not engage the donor class, not have their donors push back on them and continue to uh, to con- continue to spend. I mean, I think I think their 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 fundamental fear is if the 20 the top 20 percent get engaged in this, if we use taxation, for example, to raise revenues and the top 20 percent have to pay a share of it. I think they're I think the, the Democrats fear is the top 20 percent is going to push back on spending. They're going to say, wait. You want us to spend for it, pay for it? All right. Well, then then it's got to be low. We're into number two, which is this discussion on the fall revenue forecast. We've been talking about waiting on the revenue forecast for a while. Brad, now you say that there's going to be some people who are a little bit surprised over what's coming out uh, in the uh, fall revenue forecast, uh, what it'll do for next year's session. Let's talk about that. Well, there's been uh, all of the discussion that we've had about the FY22 budget has been based upon, well, all the discussion that the Senate Finance Committee has had about the FY22 budget has been based upon the spring revenue forecast. And the spring revenue forecast had oil at $61. And as a result of that, had fairly low traditional revenues, about a billion and a half uh, in traditional, uh, or about a billion seven in traditional revenues, uh, which led to the push to uh, not only take the 50% of the POMB, but take, you know, a large chunk of the other uh, 50% uh, for government because of the low traditional revenues. Right. Oil's been going up and up. In in August, 
uh, when uh, uh, the when the bipartisan working group was was doing its considerations and holding its hearings, uh, the Department of Revenue uh, uh, Commissioner Mahoney came in and did a presentation that revised the oil forecast from sixty one dollars to seventy two dollars and showed an additional three hundred and seventy million dollars uh, as uh, as traditional revenue. We were almost almost at that point two billion dollars um, in uh, in traditional revenue. Uh, that the the Senate Finance, which was holding hearings around the same time, didn't didn't give any credence to that. The bipartisan working group ultimately didn't either. Uh, they used the spring revenue forecast. Well, oil prices have continued to go up, and the and the and the futures strip uh, uh, has continued to go up. And now we're we're showing an eighty dollar uh, average oil price uh, for uh, for the fiscal year at eighty dollars. That's another. That's an additional six hundred and fifty million dollars, plus or minus, uh, on top of the one point six billion uh, traditional revenues shown in the in the spring forecast, and that's that takes the the traditional revenues up to you know two point two, two point two five, two point three um, uh, billion dollars. A significant increase from the spring revenue forecast. And remember, the budget, the FY twenty two budget, is based upon. Uh, the spring revenue forecast. So when the fall revenue forecast comes out, that's going to be based upon oil prices to date plus what the future strip is telling you. When the fall revenue forecast comes out in December, uh, we're likely going to see $80 oil uh, for FY22 in the fall uh, uh, in the fall revenue forecast and another $650 million uh, in, uh, in revenue, uh, in traditional revenue showing up um, in that budget. As you go into the special session, then you're going to have a $650 million. This isn't the right. This this is probably a, a misleading way to put it, but it's the right way to think about it. You're going to show a $650 million surplus relative to the spring revenue forecast uh, showing up for uh, for FY22, and this this issue persists into FY23. Um, the FY23 price is now uh, in the, the the future strip is in the mid seventy dollar range, which is about another uh, uh, five hundred million dollars, five hundred million dollars plus uh, on top of what the FY23 forecast was uh, in the in the spring uh, in the spring revenue forecast. So you're going to have some substantial additional dollars uh, show up in FY22, show up in the fall revenue forecast in FY22. And some substantial additional dollars showing up uh, uh, for for FY23 as they start putting the FY23 budget together. There's going to be a fight uh, next spring about what to do with that uh, $650 million surplus. Again, uh, sort of misleading in the sense that you know we're not back to a balanced budget, but the surplus compared to the spring revenue. There's going to be a fight about what to do about that. I suspect that Governor Dunleavy is going to say, okay, well. You know, we got 650 million more dollars than we anticipated when we put the budget together. Let's put that toward uh, a PFD. Right. And that translates into about a thousand plus uh, additional, about a thousand, right, about, right about a thousand, about a thousand dollar additional uh, 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 PFD that you could uh, that you could do with that with that surplus money. I suspect uh, uh, others in the legislature will have different thoughts about what to do with that additional money, but that's. That's significantly, I mean, we need to start wrapping our heads around what that's going to do to the debate in the special session. It's going to it's going to start sucking the air, sucking the oxygen in the room toward what to do with that surplus, um, as opposed to a discussion of a future future fiscal plan. Right. Um, and um, and 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 I think is is probably going to be another reason why. Uh, uh, we're not going to make much progress on a on on a permanent fiscal plan uh, uh, before the FY22 election. Well, I wonder if anybody will grab onto this and say, "Look, this is money that's going to be coming. Now is the time to talk about a permanent solution for the PFD and other things, because now we have the money to pay for it." Do you see anybody picking up that torch at all? And oh saying, sure, yeah, oh, maybe, oh, you know. oh sure, the governor will do that. I mean, the 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 as we've talked about on the on the program before, this oil price is not persistent. The futures market drops off quickly uh, from FY22 and FY23, and by the end of the decade, uh, it's back in the low 60s. It looks a lot like 
uh, the pre-COVID uh, uh, prices. And production, uh, I think we've hyped, I think the Dunleavy administration in the spring forecast hyped production beyond where it's going to be. So we're going to see production fall off. So yes, some people will talk about this as the basis for a for a, a permanent fix. Um, and to the extent it supports the PFD, a permanent fix of the PFD, that might be a good thing. But it's not, it's not going to be based, there's no basis on which to think that this high oil price is going to be a persistent uh, uh, condition going forward. So you think they're just going to drop back down $65, $70 a barrel and that'll stabilize down in that in the, in the near future or the midterm future? Well, that's what the that's what the futures market tells us. I mean, the futures market says that uh, we're at uh, eighty dollars for FY22, we're at seventy-seven dollars for FY23, and then FY24 is seventy-one, then sixty-seven, then sixty-four, and then it continues to go down uh, uh, right around the sixty-dollar range through the end of the through the end of the decade from uh, FY26 uh, 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 through the end of the decade. So. Um, that, uh, I mean, what what, uh, what what Department of Revenue does when they do their, their oil price forecast anymore is they take the future strip for the first three years and then they take the last year and escalate it by inflation. Uh, but that's not that's not reflecting what the futures market is thinking right now. So um, futures market says this is a the oil price spike is a temporary condition uh, that we work through. Either shale comes back. Uh, or OPEC uh, uh, re, uh, produces additional supplies, uh, or renewables start building. Uh, in some fashion, the futures market is viewing this as a as a temporary condition. But it's a temporary condition that's going to exist in the in the in the next legislative session and exist for FY22 and FY23. All right. Well, let's move on to number three, which is AML, the the Alaska Municipal League, my favorite organization. Uh, they've got a pushback now on some of the discussions that are going on around sales tax. Yeah. Uh, so this was in the context of a hearing on Garen Tars, Representative Tars' uh, proposed sales tax. It was the first opportunity since the administration hasn't introduced a sales tax, uh, although they've talked about it and Senator Showers talked about it, Senator Hughes has talked about it. There's, they've not introduced one. So it was the first opportunity to have a hearing uh, on on a sales tax, and the municipal league came in uh, pushing pushing pretty hard. I mean, basically, what the municipal league's position is: look, sales tax sales tax is our revenue base. It's the local government uh, revenue base. That's what we use along with property tax. That's what we use to generate our revenues. And if the state comes in and layers a, a, an additional sales tax on top of that, uh, then you're going to see a compression on local revenues and local government's going to be in a, in a more difficult place. Um, that was basically the theme of, uh, of the Municipal League. And I think it's notable because a lot of the discussion out of the administration, a lot of the discussion out of from Senator Shower and from Senator Hughes and others in the, on the, 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 that have talked about revenue uh, as, uh, as being part of the solution has been centered around a sales tax. And I think AML was just putting down a chip and saying, oh no, <laughs> you're gonna see our lobbying power uh, brought to bear to, uh, to uh, uh, oppose a sales tax. It's a very, uh, it's a very interesting uh, 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 set of slides. It was a very interesting presentation. Uh, I re recommend for those who really wanna understand how, that, how this issue is gonna play out that they go run through the slide deck or go, uh, you know, look at the tape of the uh, of AML's uh, AML's presentation. They, uh, you know, of course, the the whole anti tax theme has been big on both sides, and of course, the argument from Republicans and from Democrats that this is a trade off. I mean, this is all part and parcel of that, right? That this is the trade off between you have to decide between uh, a dividend and some form of taxation, whether it's sales or flat or income, whatever it is, payroll tax. That's that's how they're framing it. And this is this is all part and parcel of that debate. It is. And and this is this is the next I mean, the first level of the debate is do you need alternative revenues? And and you know, my response to that has been as long as you're using PFD cuts as revenues, yes, you need alternatives because PFD cuts are are so regressive. And so this is the next level of the debate. If you need alternative revenues, what alternative revenues um, uh, should you be using? Uh, and as I say, Senator Shower and Senator Hughes and the administration from time to time have promoted a sales tax. Um, 
AML is 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 pushing back on that, saying, "No, that's our that's our proposal." Yeah, there was a lot of there was a lot of chatter, uh, if you will, uh, on uh, on on sales tax this past week uh, on Twitter, uh, largely from Juno, which uses a sales tax uh, as its revenue base, pushing back on that, saying how unfair a state sales tax would be and how how it would compress Juno's revenue opportunities and and uh, and work against local uh, local government. So I think I think you're going to see that it it as this debate goes forward and as we talk about the need for alternate rev alternative revenues and as some push for sales taxes, I think you're going to see uh, uh, AML pushing back hard uh, right. on the sales tax option. Tuckerman Babcock in the chat room says, silly AML argument, at least 45 other states have a state sales tax as well. I mean, this is, you know, this is not uncharted territory. Many states and municipalities have balanced the needs of the communities versus the states and all these other things. Of course, none of this answers the question of why we continue to spend more than we take in uh, as well. But this is going to be kind of the new road that people are going to hoe, right? Well, yeah, I mean, it's... <laughs> It, it's it, as as long as we're using PFD cuts to fund government, as long as as long as there's a recognition that we need additional revenues of some sort to fund government, we're going to have a discussion about whether PFD. I'm going to have a discussion about whether PFD cuts are the are the right way to do it um, because of the because of its adverse impact on the economy and on and on middle and lower income Alaska families. And so, if you if you if you're if, if you're going to have some revenue source, it ought to be a fair revenue source. Uh, and the question is, uh, question is what revenue source uh, that is. Um, AML makes the point that sales taxes are also regressive. They also push a burden, a larger share of the burden to middle and lower income uh, uh, families. Uh, that's sort of their second argument on top of after after the first argument of hey, you're taking our tax base. So, yeah, <laughs> there are other states that do that have sales taxes at both levels. Uh, AML discusses uh, the AML discuss the presentation discusses that to some degree, in the context of Colorado, where there's a sort of a, a sort of an agreement between local government and state government on how the, how they're going to do sales taxes. There's also some discussion. AML also made some point about a carve out. That is, you know, you you would have a cap on sales taxes, say seven percent, uh, if the if the sale if the state to the to the max, or if the local government taxes the couldn't have any additional uh, tax on top of that. So it's going to be, as we go down this road, it's going to be a continual discussion. I just think uh, the AML AML weighing into it, having an opportunity by having a hearing on sales taxes and AML weighing into it sort of uh, creates the uh, creates the opportunity to sort of see what the other side of the discussion is going to be. Well, and there's some irony here. Willie Keppel points out, Willie out of Quinnahawk points out that AML has been wanting to cut, uh, wanting to get online sales and uh, take a cut from all the taxes on online sales and distribute all those online taxes to the villages and the smaller communities. So it's good for the one side, but it's not good for the other for the other right i mean that's that's it, it's amazing how these people can change their flag and it can flip in the wind in one direction or another yeah well yeah <laughs> that's that's the nature of fiscal battles though right i mean everybody right. sort of sort of you know argues i mean that's how we've gotten to pfd cuts the top 20 percent argued that ah, shouldn't be us uh, push it off on uh, push it off on middle and lower income alaska families everybody sort of you know, looks out for themselves and and sort of tries to wrap it in the flag of uh, of motherhood and apple pie, right? Um, and that's yeah, you know, and that's what the AML uh, uh, presentation is. It's the it's the motherhood and apple pie presentation from the from the standpoint of those who who don't want the state to be uh, to be raising revenues through a sales tax. We got about three minutes here, Brad. Give me a preview in your mind as you look at all this stuff laying out um, of the. Uh, of the of the election 2022 i mean we've got uh, depending on what happens with the redistricting but we can pretty much assume that every legislator is going to be up for re-election the governor's race uh plus we've got the jungle primary and the ranked choice voting and everything else just give me in your mind a preview of uh of what this looks like uh in the in the coming uh in the coming you know 15 months what are we looking at you know michael it, it could be that we're back to uh, 2018. If we've got $80 oil uh, and it's persisting uh, through next year, uh, there's some arguments why it wouldn't. There's some arguments why it would go higher. 
that if we've got $80 oil and the futures market, the current futures market is right, and it's persisting more or less uh, through next year, that's the price we had uh, when we did the 2018 election. Uh, and when Governor Dunleavy was arguing that we could, you know, resolve all of this through spending cuts, uh, that, you know, oil had come to save us again. Uh, and, um, and, and, you know, all we needed were some spending cuts around the margin and we would be fine. We could, and then, and then he's got the POMV 50, 50 as sort of his, as sort of, you know, a source of additional revenues, uh, that he didn't use in 2018 because, you know, that's about, was that about 500, 700 million dollars in, in PFD cuts that then are diverted to, uh, to government. So we may see, uh, it could be, and then, you know, and then Walker's talking about, oh, you know, we've got a horrible future ahead of us and we need to, you know, we need to get our house in order uh, during, in, a, in a context where the oil price is staying up. So um, it could look a lot like, like, uh, like 2018. Um, and then you've got House members and Senate legislators who are splitting in the same way uh, that, uh, that, the, that the gubernatorial candidates are splitting. Right. Well, I think it's going to be... Uh... This is the whole Confucius saying of may you live in interesting times. That is the definition of our lifetimes right now of everything that's going on between uh, the pandemic and the and the uh, polit the politics and the changes to the electorate. And I mean, all this other kind of stuff. We are definitely living in some interesting times. That's for sure. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, final thoughts here about 30 seconds. Well, it, it is going to be interesting times. Um, probably not too interesting the remainder of this legislative session, but I think that I think the, the special session. But I think the next big event that uh, people ought to be starting to wrap their heads around is the is the fall revenue forecast in the governor's uh, FY twenty three budget, and then the special session or the regular session next year dealing with this quote surplus that we will have uh, coming out of uh, FY twenty two. And again, <clears throat> your prediction is that everything will be pushed off uh, because of the election. We won't get a fiscal pr plan next year either as well. So it, it is what it is, I guess. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming in board on board. I appreciate it. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Good to hear from you this morning. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.